Cyber Week, you're going to find this to be uh, one of the most intriguing and maybe possibly even the most alarming of all the presentations that we've had here as well. Again, I want to thank all of you for coming uh, and being part of this uh, process. But I'm going to single out three people for particular thank yous. Um, the first of them I'm going to single out is uh, my assistant, Tom Keelan. Tom, if you want to stand for a second for all your hard work in doing this while I've been traveling for a good part of this and helping all this come together, including our reception at the end. I also want to give thank Carl Hartill, Carl, from the embassy for his help and support for putting this uh, project together. And then also I want to thank uh, for coming my, the co-founder of the Quantum Alliance Initiative, Idalia Friedson. If Idalia Friedson wants to take a quick bow, there she is, and so on. She was the one, it was just about, it was almost exactly a year ago today, wasn't it? It was the 17th of October that we organized our first quantum technology uh, conference on quantum revolution, uh, and it was the first time that the term uh, national quantum initiative got bandied about in public as far as a discussion of what the UNS needed to do and what the United States needed to go and think about if they were going to win this quantum technology revolution. Um, and one of the speakers that we had for that occasion, as a matter of fact, was this guy, Scott Totsky. Great to be back. It's great to have you back, as a matter of fact. Now, Scott, you have to understand, is someone who brings to this discussion not only, as you'll see, a very interesting presentation with regard to the question of quantum safe cybersecurity, but also a lot of experience in this kind of an area. For more than a decade, he's been a system developer, network ar architect, and consultant. He originally joined BlackBerry back in 2001. Uh, and as senior vice president at BlackBerry, he helped shape security, regulatory compliance, lawful access, and privacy uh, strategies on a truly global scale. So he knows this terrain very, very well in thinking about the relationship between technology and security, as well as issues of privacy. After BlackBerry, Scott then assumed the role of senior vice president uh, at enterprise and security at Huawei. Yes. Which brings another level of experience, I should say, uh, these days when we're thinking about the relationship with the U.S. and China in, across the competition for high-tech supremacy, but particularly in quantum technology. He launched their R&D office in Waterloo and drove their global, global strategy for delivering mobility solutions to enterprise and government customers. We just, some of us, hope he didn't uh, uh, drive their global strategy too well or too far. I but didn't. in any case, that was, that, was, that, is what, that, is, that is the world of technology uh, and the world of IT. Anyway, right now, Scott is chief executive officer and co-founder of ICERA Corporation, uh, which works very closely in, in this area and has been a good friend and, and, uh, of, of Hudson. We've worked together on a number of projects. Scott, I'm going to turn controls over to you. Perfect. Well, I have a few slides, and then we'll chat and take lots of questions, I'm sure. In fact, I'm going to sit down here to watch the slides. All right. Okay. Are they all queued up, and will this make it? We do not have slides for me. OK. I don't have any slides. They were brilliant. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously, Thomas, did, did we have a, are we having a gap here? Uh, do you have a, an adapter for a Mac? I, we were those slides. OK, the slides would have been brilliant, so trust me on that. Uh, but we'll go without slides. So um, uh, thank you, Arthur, for the introduction. And uh, I am the founder and CEO of ICERA. So ICERA sits in Quantum Valley. And we're sort of at the bottom of this, this chain that we've been talking about uh, all day here, where um, we're members of Communitech. We've used the services of Communitech as we've grown a business over the last three and a half years. So they've helped with some of our early marketing strategies, some of the talent acquisition strategies we've had to do, and kind of lead generation where uh, as companies come through uh, the Kitchener-Waterloo area, Communitech reaches out to do some matchmaking. So we've gotten introduced to a number of multinational companies that we're now doing business with as a result of that relationship. So. We're part of that. Uh, we're funded by Quantum Valley Investments. We're one of the first uh, 
investments that, that Mike you made uh, three and a half years ago to start this company focused on quantum time. information security so, so or protecting the world from quantum computers. Uh, and we collaborate quite regularly with the University of Waterloo and the Institute for Quantum Computing, um, where we do joint research or we offer opportunities for graduates and postdoc students to come and do research at more of a... Scott, I've got a quick question. Yeah? Uh, that's okay. No, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I'll flip through them here. You just, you'll just have to trust me on how great they look. Um, <laughs> so we, 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 do, uh, we do a lot of, of kind of collaboration with the university. And what, what hasn't been talked about, I know we've said a lot about the University of Waterloo and the co-op program and the focus on physics. It's also the largest faculty of mathematics in the world. And there's a long history of cryptographic research that goes on at the University of Waterloo. Earlier this morning, Mike mentioned CERTICOM. Uh, where uh, there was a professor there, Scott Vanstone, and, and a group of other profs at UW who optimized elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, that became an industry, and ECC became a standard that uh, uh, the industry has been using probably since like 2001, 2002, in, in really constrained devices as, as its ideal use case. Um, I'll also say that I am an IT security guy and a business person. I am not a scientist, a physicist, or a mathematician, so hopefully we won't have any really hard uh, questions in that area. And it's also really tough to go last, especially without slides, because most of what I'd like to cover has already been talked about in great detail. So one of the things we see with quantum computing, and there's a famous quote here that uh, uh, Richard Feynman says, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And I think every physicist here would agree with that. Um, there's a reason this is hard and difficult, and while we're still learning what quantum physics is, we don't really understand why things work the way they do. And often when I talk to smart guys like, like Thomas, it's because it's just the way things work is kind of the answer, which doesn't satisfy my engineering brain all the time, but um, it's an important point to note. And the other thing, you we always struggle with analogies, and how do we try and take something that is unrelatable and different from how we perceive the world and how we think the world should operate and translate that into ways that we can digest in our brain. So one of the things I usually talk about is, I put us in a time machine, we go back to 1903 when the Wright brothers flew their first airplane. So at that time, that airplane was one horsepower, and you had a horse that was one horsepower. Now the most efficient way to move around was using a horse. And while you can make horses faster, you could never make them fly. So they were both modes of tra transportation, but they allowed you to do things differently. And ultimately, we see today things you could do with an airplane you could never do. You can't fly across the Atlantic on a horse, no matter how many horses you have. Uh, but you can with an airplane. Right? And that's really what quantum computing is when we compare it to today's classical computing. There are some things that it can just do better. Another way to think about this maybe is if you've got a, a car and you're driving around the block here. Right? You can drive around the block here and you can you can walk around it, and that's slow, and you can get a slow car, and you can go around the block. You can get a really fast car and go around the block even faster. Or you can get a helicopter, and you can fly from one side to the other. You accomplish the same result. You get from A to B, but taking that helicopter over the building, you do that faster with fewer steps. And so while a, comp a quantum computer won't always be faster at doing something, it will do less steps to accomplish the same thing. And in that way, we'll get more efficiency in how we carry out complex calculations. So those are my analogies. The slides would have been brilliant. Um, we've heard a lot about this investment in quantum computing. Uh, Arthur enumerated all the different investments going around the world. And there's a lot going on. It's Canada, the US, China, the UK, the EU. Uh, we have large, <laughs> that's OK, Martin. <laughs> we have large uh, multinationals, IBM, Google. We've got startups like Rigetti. Everybody is on this kind of fast track to build the first large scale quantum computer. And there's, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And part of it is we get to solve problems we can't solve today at all. Right? So when we think about this, again, from a layperson's perspective, we had a little dialogue about quantum sensors. Right? If we can make quantum sensors really efficient, and we can take that and translate to the oil and gas industry, we can start to save a tremendous amount of money for companies like ExxonMobil in their exploration for new oil and gas discovery. Right, because those sensors will detect when they have a viable operation sooner, so they can either continue to invest or they can, make aban they can abandon their investment. So that becomes things that save billions of dollars. We can look at quantum chemistry. Right? We uh, spend about 3% of the world's energy making fertilizer. 
right? Nature does a great job doing composting. We don't really understand how that works. So if we can start to use quantum chemistry to understand how to make fertilizer more efficiently, we can better feed the world's population more cost effectively. And we've had some discussions about material science. And we have materials like the material we use to transport energy over the power grid. And if we can create superconducting materials that operate at normal temperatures, we can take that 10 to 12% energy that we lose over the electricity grid, and we can preserve that by being more efficient in transport, transporting electricity. What this all means is we are on, on the cusp of a new set cycle of innovation. If you look at what's happened in Silicon Valley, all that wealth creation that we've had for the last 40 or 50 years, all the work that we've done to create new technologies, new companies, and billions and trillions of dollars of wealth because of the early investments that went on in the 70s and 80s, is now about to be repeated on a larger global scale by being the first organization to have a large-scale quantum computer that will let you attack these problems, build new technologies, build new solutions, and bring them to market sooner than anyone else in the world. So if China's first, or the US is first, or Russia is first, you start to control a decades-long innovation agenda where you have a substantial lead to bring technologies and products to market that the rest of the world can't do because you're uniquely positioned with your investments in quantum computing to do that. On the disruptive side, um, I like to talk a lot about this thing called the uh, kryptonite bike lock. So those of you who had bikes, you had this U-shaped thing, you plug it together, it was like this $150, $200 lock, I think in the 80s it started coming out. And uh, it was the impenetrable lock to protect your bike. And then somebody took a 29 cent thick pen and they stuck it in the lock and they turned it and the lock opened. So suddenly you had this expensive lock to protect your expensive bike and a little piece of plastic defeating the security that that lock, protected your, that, <laughs> that lock was used to protect your bike with. So quantum computers are not 29 cents. They are several billions of dollars probably by the time we see them in, in any sort of large scale. Uh, but that's what they're gonna do to security. They will take everything that we've invested in from the 70s till now in terms of asymmetric or public key crypto, and they will break that essentially as easily as that big pen broke the, uh, the locking mechanism on the kryptonite bike lock. I got a quote from Will Hurd. So he's on the Homeland Security Cybersecurity Committee. He's uh, Senator, uh, Representative Will Hurd out of, out of Texas. Uh, in his op-ed piece in Wired, uh, the impact of quantum on our national defense will be tremendous. The question is whether the United States and its allies will be ready. That was published in December 2017. So what we are starting to see, and a lot of it is the work that Arthur and team started last year, is recognition within the policymakers here in DC that we have to do something if we want to protect national assets from adversaries who are going to develop quantum computers potentially sooner than we do. The other thing that I have here is from the stack, and again, it's a beautiful slide, but basically the, the summary here is everything that we do for HTTPS. So that little lock icon you get on your browser when you wanna buy something on Amazon or check your bank balance, everything that we do to protect our digital transactions today is vulnerable to attacks from quantum computers. And we have a lot of public key cryptography that we have to move, and in this case they say, it may be less than a decade in order to make that switch. All of that leads up to some of the policy discussions, including the national, uh, the national Strategic Overview for Quantum Information Science that came out last month here in Washington, where there's a very clear call out that we need to do something now if we want to start protecting our systems and make sure that they are ready for adversaries that have quantum, quantum computers that may be used to attack us. And what it says here is requiring moving to post-quantum or quantum resistance cryptography is something that is going to be needed to, de do, needed to be done now to protect and provide reliable infrastructure over the long term. So again, growing recognition really in the last 12 months that we have to start doing something now if we want to protect our systems in the future. When you look at public key cryptography, this is the most successful thing that we've done as an industry from a technology standpoint, I would say, in, in the history of the IT industry going back to the 70s. We took really good technology in the, in the 70s, RSA, public key cryptography, basically, uh, factoring of semi-prime numbers, and made security systems based on that that has served this industry well for almost 50 years. I don't think there's another piece of technology that we invented in the 70s that is relatively unchanged today that does exactly what it was intended to do. And whether we are technologists 
or we're just complete neophytes and we just don't know anything about technology, we will use public key cryptography a thousand times a day. Getting an update for your phone, signing onto your Wi-Fi network at home, checking your email, asking Google Maps to give you a direction someplace. All of these transactions are built on public key cryptography to authenticate who you are as a user, to ensure that your software update hasn't been modified or tampered with, to make sure that you can actually digitally transact in your life. And it impacts what we do at home, our phones, our personal computers, the Nest thermostats that we have connected, all the things that connect to our network at home, uh, you know, getting in, uh, watching the latest movie on Netflix, we're using public key cryptography to authenticate who you are and give you a digitally rights protected stream to watch on your TV. We have connected vehicles emerging where we have vehicles talking to vehicles, we have vehicles talking to infrastructure, we have some cars that are getting software updates. Uh, we have complex transportation systems like the things that guide train systems or, or airline navigation systems or airport control systems. Again, using public key cryptography, the enterprise computing use cases, using a VPN to sign into your office. Again, very much focused on public key cryptography. And really, every way that we do things online today that protect us in the enterprise is very much reliant on a foundational principle using cryptography as a way to check all of the integrity of the systems and the transactions that we do online. When you think of this, and again, I'm a security guy, from a, a threat perspective, we've had to deal with all kinds of security threats over the last couple of decades. You know, we've looked at this, and you know, I kind of look at this in terms of a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid, you know, we, we like to blame users. We've had poor user behavior. You know, somebody sees a USB key, they take that out of the parking lot, they stick it in their computer, they click on links and email systems. User behavior probably still and forever will be one of the hardest security things for us to overcome. But then we get into things like administration. We don't configure a system properly. So we misconfigure a firewall in the enterprise and then adversaries can penetrate that firewall and get access to our corporate data. We have poor architecture decisions in how we design systems. Uh, we have implementation problems in how we do that. Or we have a platform where there's a bug in the latest version of OS X or latest version of Windows and that bug gets exploited and that becomes a problem from a security standpoint. As an industry, what we haven't seen is a fundamental failure of cryptography. And that's that lowest layer of the pyramid. We use cryptography to ensure that the operating system hasn't been tampered with, that the software update is, incomplete, is complete, that the transaction is authenticated, that the user is authorized. And we haven't had to deal with this low-level failure within our cryptographic systems before. So when that happens, this will be kind of catastrophic from a security standpoint. It really is an unprecedented security threat that we can see ahead of us. So one of the areas to shift away from technology, because some people are technologists, some of us aren't, is to look at the automotive industry. So the automotive industry is going through a tremendous amount of disruption. Everything that could possibly change the way we interact with our cars and the way that car OEMs build cars and deliver, to, deliver them to us is changing. We're going through electrification. So we see a big push on that with Tesla leading the way from an innovation standpoint. We're seeing over-the-air software updates where your car is just going to be like your smartphone. Again, Tesla is the model for that, where you know, there was uh, just a hurricane in the Carolinas a couple of weeks ago, and Tesla pushed out a software update to all of their owners to extend the range on their battery, just like they did in Florida last year. They're able to change the way your car behaves just with software updates. The automotive industry today, as a whole, spends 20 to $30 billion a year in automotive recalls. Most of those are really for a technician to stick a USB drive into your car and do a software update. What they'd really like to do is take that cost out of the system so that when you pull into your driveway at home, you can get a software update just like when you update your cell phone. So there's a big push to do over-the-air software updates. And then under the covers, that platform is changing. Cars are becoming very much a connected network, just like an Ethernet network in an office, or just like your home network, where today we use something called a CAN bus. Five or six years from now, that'll be gigabit Ethernet. And all the components in there will exchange messages no different than you signing on to check your bank balance in a bank, in, in, when, where the uh, collision avoidance system talking to the braking system needs to have a highly authenticated transaction so they don't uh, automatically apply, apply your brakes if some you know, rogue hacker has just told every car on the beltway to stop. Now, I know that doesn't affect Washington traffic because about two hours from now, every car will be stopped, but it could be like that all day long. So for these guys to be successful, 
we're looking at this timeline. So people ask, when are we going to have a quantum computer? And that quantum computer, IBM has said, you've got five years. Right? We saw that slide from Mike this morning, where at the earliest estimate from them is, is 2023, and you'll see quantum computers that are a cryptographic threat. I think uh, most of the people here who are physicists and focused on quantum computers say that's maybe a little optimistic. At the other end of the scale, IBM uh, NSA's current guidance is 2030. So we have a range of like five to 12 years when we have to be prepared. Now, if I'm a car manufacturer, I am already looking at the 2025 model year. So if you go talk to General Motors, you go talk to Volkswagen, you go talk to BMW, they're really looking five to seven years in the future. So they are designing the 2024, 2025 model year, and they want to do autonomous driving, and they want to do over-the-air software updates, and they want to do vehicle to infrastructure communication, and they have all these business drivers pushing them there. And then those cars will be on the road for 15 years. So that 2024 model year is going to be on the road till 2039, 2040, well past the most pessimistic, pessimistic dates on when we'll see a quantum computer. So the last thing we want to see is a rogue software update hitting every car in DC when they drive into work in the morning, and then nobody can go home. Right? Or a nation state telling traffic to just randomly change direction, speed up, slow down, because they can forge a software update or they can forge commands to the car. So the automotive manufacturers look at this as a safety feature. It's like brakes and airbags and collision avoidance systems. As information security now needs to be a imperative for them in order to protect the safety of the occupants of the car. Whether they're driving or not, they need to have a long-lived security model. So we already see the automotive ma manufacturers looking at this quantum safe security as an important part of the next generation automotive security platform because they're going to have to live with the results of that for 15 years post the release of their car. Now there's a lot of different ways to, to address this and we had a couple questions this morning about standards. One of the things that's going on very much focused here in, in, in the US is a competition that NIST is running where they're evaluating what are the next generation cryptographic standards that we're going to use. And really, there's five different areas of math. We, we kind of relied on RSA and elliptic curve cryptography as, as the areas for public key cryptography for the last you know, 20 to 50 years. Now we're looking at hash-based schemes, code-based, lattice-based, multivariant-based, and isogeny-based. A whole lot of different areas of math that, as I said, not a mathematician. Uh, most of those have been studied for 30 or 40 years. So one of the important elements when we talk about cryptographic systems and ensuring that we have comfort that they provide security is also looking at them for 30 or 40 years to say, yeah, we've done a lot of academic study. We understand the security that these provide to us. We understand how exploitable they are or are not. And we understand from a theory perspective what the best and most practical attacks are. So most of those systems uh, kind of fall into this category of they were invented in the late 70s and early 80s. They've been studied since then, but we had a great set of standards we didn't have to do anything about. So they've been refined in academia, but they haven't been refined to a point that makes them practical to use in a connected world like we have today. The outlier there is isogeny-based systems. They're probably 10 to 12 years old. Uh, David Jow from the University of Waterloo is one of the leading researchers in that area. So again, going back to that ecosystem, uh, we have a lot of that right in our backyard. Ultimately, as we change from what we use today to where we need to be in the future, we need to ensure that we have a seamless migration. Our users have to behave the way they do today. Uh, the technology has to work in the same footprint. We can't have everybody going out and upgrading all of their technology because they have to get from where they are today to a quantum safe future. So we have to make sure that as we migrate and deploy new technology, it fits into the existing footprint we have, and that's CPUs and networks and memory utilization. That's everything from an IoT sensor to a large data center like, say, Amazon's uh, cloud service. And the challenge that we have as we go through this is we have to maintain interoperability. So we need to be forward and backwards compatible. Uh, we have to make sure that we have capabilities to address critical infrastructure first. So when you think about how we have to attack this problem, I'm probably not so concerned about my credit card transactions. Credit card transactions are ephemeral in nature. Um, I'm going to get a new card every two or three years. And if something goes catastrophically wrong, you know, my bank can just cancel my credit card and issue me a new one. But they're probably more concerned about how they, act, how they connect into the back end systems, like how do I authenticate into the SWIFT network. When I start doing the more 
B2B or bank-to-bank -bank transfers, and I'm moving billions of dollars on a daily basis. I'm really concerned as a financial services industry that those transactions are quantum safe, because if they're not, we destabilize the entire fabric of the economy. Right? So it's OK if a user, because there's all kinds of checks and balances for you as an individual user. But when we start talking about that institutional transaction into the SWIFT network, interbranch transfers, those sorts of things, we have to make sure we do that. And we also have to make sure this isn't a tremendous burden from a cost perspective. We can't have billions and billions of dollars to replace and upgrade infrastructure. Um, that's just not going to be practical either. So what we really need is to focus on something called cryptographic agility building capabilities into our systems today that allow us to start where we are today with classical systems, recognize that over the next decade we're going to have to go through a migration, and throughout that process be forwards and backwards compatible so that I can start deploying technology today that is both quantum safe and classically safe and allow me to interact with my legacy systems that are still using old crypto and my new updated systems that are using quantum safe crypto. I tend to pick on uh, the Department of Defense because it's a really good target to kind of illustrate the complexity of this problem. And unfortunately, that is a slide that would really help. Um, the DOD PKI, or the Public Key Infrastructure, this is how we manage identity within the US Department of Defense. There are 4.5 million users on the DOD PKI, and they all have what's called a common access card or a PIV card. So it's an identity badge. It's got their credentials on that badge. It lets you get into the building, lets you unlock your computer lets you digitally sign an email message, lets you authenticate a transaction if you're going to sign on to, say, the VA system and you want to check your health information or whatever other records might be on that system, you use your CAC card to do that. Uh, the DOD PKI is not an isolated system, right? So we've got the Department of Defense, but it also talks to Treasury because Treasury runs Homeland Security's PKI. It talks to the 5i intelligence partners. They talk to the financial services companies. It talks to strategic vendors like Lockheed and Boeing. So it's a complex web of commercial, uh, private sector, public sector technology that has to interact. Not all of that is going to be upgradable at one time. So we need to make sure we look at how we approach the way we're going to migrate this technology so we can start to do it on a priority basis so that you know, I can upgrade portions of the DOD PKI, but I don't have to upgrade all of it. I don't have to worry about my partners. So I can do part of it in isolation and still allow for forwards and backwards compatibility. A lot of that gets accomplished through standards. And this is an area that ICERA focuses a lot on. So we had a question this morning about standards. And standards are absolutely critical. So when we talk about cryptography, cryptography is ultimately a language. Right? We have to speak the same language. So. Um, you and I have to have the same mathematical equations. The same input has to give the same output. So if we're doing math, we both have to get the same answer, kind of like grade school. I'm a little more complicated on the math side. But we have to make sure that we build telecommunication standards that allow us to have a multiple vendor scenario where we can all build technologies that speak the same language so we can interoperate. So the question this morning, uh, there's one about Etsy and telecommunication standards. So Etsy is the European Telecommunication Standard Institute. Um, they wrote something called the GSM standard in the mid 80s. In fact, my COO was one of the authors of that standard. And that's the reason your phone works in 190 different countries. Because 40 years ago, a bunch of guys from Motorola and a few other uh, vendors like Ericsson and Nokia got together and said, this is how mobile technology should work. This is how we should communicate. And if everybody adopts this, we can have all kinds of different vendors that play in this ecosystem for interoperability purposes. And we can deploy this technology globally. And your phone's going to just work, which is kind of how it works today. Now, we want standards for a couple of different reasons. We want interoperability, right? because we want to make sure we can have a disparate vendor set that's going to allow for technology to work together, because that's how the world works today. We need them to be international, right? because we're not going to get all of the, the solutions we need domestically. We have to make sure we have international standards. And they also provide market access. right? If you can take your intellectual property, get it into different standards, then those standards can be used to help uh, propel your business. And all of this is part of our strategy. Now, we're talking here about Canada. So how many Canadians are left in the audience here? Just a few. So in Canada, we enjoy this thing called the Robertson screwdriver. It's a domestic. Anybody in the US know what a Robertson screwdriver is? No? OK. So this is a great Canadian standard. And I think Scotland adopted it. And that's it. So we have this thing. It's a square-headed screwdriver. 
So you can put a screw on it, screw it into the ceiling, screw it into the wall. It'll never fall off, unlike a Phillips screwdriver or a slot screwdriver. It's absolutely fantastic. Everybody in Canada loves it. Nobody outside of Canada knows what it is. I promise you, if you were to try it, you'd say, why are we not using this? Well, it's a Canadian-only standard. So a key part to evolving the technology industry is making sure that we do international standards and we make sure that everybody can use those standards for interoperability purposes. And then the last piece, and we had a question this morning, really about how is you know, the Canadian Defense Department and government looking at this? And I think when you think about quantum safe security and how we have to evolve the technology industry, you have to look at what do we need to do to really kind of protect, and I don't want to be too, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Arthur could get away with saying, how do we protect democracy in the free world? How do we make sure that we have a stable civil society where we rely on technology? And today we use security to ensure that we can transact our digital lives, whether that's us as an individual or whether that's the government protecting the economy, protecting the way that the country is run. As we look at quantum threats, we need to make sure that quantum safe security becomes that strategic enabler for preserving everything we protect today from a digital standpoint. And that can be autonomous cars in the future. It can be my personal shopping transaction at Amazon, the way my cell phone connects to the network. Or it can be the communication thing between the F-35 and the, uh, you know, the, the guys that are maintaining the plane. That F-35, I think it collects about 10 terabytes a minute of data when it's flying. So it's a flying compute platform. And it has to interact and interoperate with all the allies who you know, use that fighter or depend on data that come from that fighter, or how we protect the way the economy is managed through uh, the banking system here in the US. All of these require quantum safe security. And when I talk to you know, the defense folks in Canada and we talk about the quantum threat, one of the things that you'll hear, and I've heard it from Canadians, Americans, really all of the five eyes that I've talked to in the last three years is, we essentially look at this today as a data breach that started about a decade ago, and we don't have a solution. So what I mean by that is there's a real concern, whether you're here in the US or in Canada or elsewhere, that our adversary, you can say China or Russia or some other unnamed adversary that's working on quantum information system, systems, is collecting all the communications we have today, storing them in a data center, and when they have a quantum computer sometime in the next decade, they'll be able to go back and undo all of the security of today's communications. And if you're a government user, specifically in defense, um, you're dealing with data that may have a 25-year secrecy obligation. So I can credibly say that communications in 2010 that were done electronically need to be protected until 2035. And based on what we hear in the industry, that's well past when we're going to see quantum computers. And every day, that data breach continues to go and go on further and further and further. So ICERA has really been focused on building a portfolio of technology that is standards-based, that provides that cryptographic agility, that forwards and backwards compatibility, and allows the various vendors that supply technology solutions to government as well as consumers to integrate that into their portfolio today and start building that quantum safe future. So those were the slides. I know you were all just dazzled by the graphics, but uh, um, thank you very much. Sorry it was a little rocky. I, I do apologize. I don't know what happened with the, uh, the slide deck. No, it's, we're, we're sorry too. Yeah. What we'll tell you, thank you. Thank you. Please. What we'll do is the slides will be available. We'll have them up on the website. You can, uh, so when you go to the Hudson website, click on our event, Go. You can watch Scott's speech over again, but you'll also have access to the slide decks for all of our speakers. It'll all be there and, and ready to go. Um, I actually thought you spoke very eloquently without the slides. And what I noticed is one of the things I've noticed sometimes when people don't have the PowerPoint, that the audience focus gets more on the words and what you're saying and what, what's coming across verbally instead of attention wandering over to check out the slides. And I think I, think I definitely, I felt that way, and I think some of the audience Good. may have as well. So I think it, I think it was, a, I, think, I think it worked out okay. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad. But boy, have I got a lot of questions for okay, you. Okay, I will try and answer them. Uh, and then we're gonna open up to some, que to some questions, and then we'll adjourn for our reception. Um, my first question is, this is a conference on Quantum Valley. Yeah. Uh, 
your offices sit, if you're not actually part of the campus, you sit on the very edge of the campus. What I want to know is, from where you are as a private company, how does being part of the Quantum Valley ecosystem work for you within ISARA? Now, given the fact that you're an old BlackBerry alumnus yeah. <laughs> uh, and your connections with Mike and that, and, that, and that crew go back a ways, but even apart from that and being in that kind of an environment in which there's quantum technology and quantum technicians and scientists working all this kind of way, how does that how does that affect the way in which ICERA operates? Well, there's a whole bunch here. So the first thing is, um, uh, this morning Mike talked about patient capital. So we're one of the beneficiaries of that. So we have uh, seed invest investment from Quantum Valley Investments to get this company off the ground, and we've been operating for about three and a half years based on that initial investment. So without Quantum Valley, that that doesn't happen, and, and we're also in one of the buildings, which means we've got good proximity to to Mike and his network. As well as you know, IQC and the University of Waterloo, so we're right on the edge of that campus, and the connection in that ecosystem really allows for us to tap into uh, leading research. Um, uh, Ray, who was here this morning, said you know, he considers us somewhat of a spin out from IQC because a lot of the work mm. that they were doing um, led to uh, researchers at IQC putting a paper together that analyzed the security threat of quantum computers on telecommunication protocols. And that was published about four and a half years ago. And that was really the genesis for ICERA. Is we, we looked at the paper and said, well, somebody's got to do it. Here in Waterloo, we've got a, a concentration of, of you know, highly qualified people. We've got mathematicians. We've got physicists. We've got quantum information science experts. Uh, we have some experienced uh, international business leaders who kind of grew up in BlackBerry and learned how to deal with security issues on a global scale. And uh, it really created a kind of a perfect ecosystem where we've got a great talent pool. And I think part of being in this is um, when you start talking to, you know, really the, the really good mathematicians and engineers is part of what drives them, and I know we've had a lot of negative climate jokes about Canada being cold, um, but part of what drives them even more than that is solving hard problems. And one of the, the really great things about doing what we're doing in Waterloo is we get to say, look, we're taking a world-class problem that very few people are working on anywhere globally, and we're solving it right here. So you may want to go to Silicon Valley, you may want to go to Europe, um, but why don't you come and talk to us? And we're actually being quite successful in retaining talent in the region, and you know we compete. I mean, Google's right in our backyard. Their office is in, in Kitchener, halfway between our office and, and Communitech's headquarters is, is Google's Canadian headquarters. Um, we compete with Google and Microsoft and a bunch of others for the same talent. And we're finding that that ecosystem allows us to win most of the time, especially if they're looking at what are the big hard problems that we can go and kind of apply our, my training to and do this in a commercial context where I can see the kind of commercial realization of what I'm working on in a much kind of clearer and sooner uh, way than if I stay in academia or I get into like a big multinational where there's 100,000 other engineers working on similar problems. Yeah. Now, when I, when, when I go into ICERA Corporation offices and wander out and meet people there, I meet 20-somethings uh, sitting at desks, and then they go out into the hallway, and then these, these big whiteboards covered with blue and black numbers and so There's no numbers. And oh. <laughs> I learned, I, I actually thought that math involved numbers. Apparently it doesn't. <laughs> and it's, it's like, it's hieroglyphics. It's like, what are they doing? Uh, they're working on these math, these fields of math. So we're looking at uh, a lot of the academic research on, say, lattice-based cryptography or isogenies. And we're looking at, um, how can we improve the performance to meet the real world expectations? So a really good example is... Uh, so is this, all, this is all what they call the quantum resistant algorithm? Quantum, quantum resistance or quantum safe cryptography. So we, we have some transactions, so we, we, we implemented one of the, the schemes in lattice-based cryptography and we, we did it according to the academic research and um, we implemented it and it would take two hours to negotiate a key. Which is great, because as Ray said in, in in, in the morning session, you know, when you're looking at this from an academic perspective, you really want to make sure you're covering all of the corners to make sure you're complete and you're thorough and that the, the, the equations give you the sort of uh, comfort that you're looking for in terms of 
um, the correctness and the security attributes. So two hours for you to, I know one of you, two hours for me to check my bank balance is not gonna be good. It's certainly, I'm an impulse shopper on Amazon. Two hours to order whatever I want on Amazon is too long. Your so wife might prefer that. She would prefer that a lot. I'm worse but, than but she is. <laughs> but uh, then we, we look at how can we modify and optimize that and now that same transaction takes about 400 milliseconds. So it's right in line with what an RSA or ECC transaction would be. Hmm. And so the kind of basic research we're doing from a mathematical standpoint is how do we improve the performance? Because we have to fit into you know, the user expectations. As I said, it's gotta be seamless. So you can't go from something that's instantaneous to even something that takes a minute, because that's just not gonna be good. Um, it has to fit into the memory footprint because we start looking at constrained IoT devices. And it has to work on small processors because as we look at that connected car, those are not big, fast processors. There's less processing power than you know, your cell phone. So we have to make sure we can optimize the math to get to a point where that. So a lot of what you saw there was our, we have 11 postdocs now looking at how they optimize some of the, uh, the mathematical equations without compromising the security but to improve the performance. Right, so it doesn't take as long. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was in Krakow at the, at the CyberSec Forum, uh, we had a briefing there on sort of the latest trends and cybercrime and uh, cybercrime in the future. And one of the points that was raised by one of the analysts from Price Waterhouse in London was that the, uh, the computer hackers they're long past the point of trying to empty your bank account or you know, hack your credit card. They're, 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 they're going up the value chain. Yeah. And where they're located now, their targets are things like, for example, uh, a, a bank transaction exchanges. Uh, they're looking at uh, operating systems of the banks themselves so they can just simply siphon it off at the source. Sure. So that is gonna be when, when the quantum computer that can do that kind of hacking comes, that's where, that's where they're gonna be directing their attention from the very beginning. So the question of what you call the great migration, right? The migration from classical cryptography to its, to its successors. Um, is this a process that has to begin at the very top of the value chain? Is that where the key priorities and the most sensitive government documents? Or is this something in which I've got a small startup company or a mid-sized company, and I've got personnel records, and I've got data, and I've got IP information, and uh, I'm just going to wait until, uh, until, the Swift, until Swift is, in fact, uh, quantum yep. resistant before I have to make a move and start thinking about these things? Yeah. So, you know, I think if you look at it from any enterprise, we're going to know, we, we might not know where we use cryptography to protect things, because, you know, we, again, it kind of, it's under the covers and behind the scenes, it's embedded, and, and you know, as ubiqui ubiquitous as it is, we don't always know where we're using it. But, you know, large enterprises have a good, well-established, in most cases, risk management process. So, um, one of the things that I would recommend is you start looking as an enterprise, we're a government agency, at what are the most critical assets that you need to protect from an electronic transaction standpoint? And then start doing the work back on when do you need to have those transactions properly secured. So in a very general case, if you're a large complex enterprise, you're a large bank here in the US, a multinational bank, or you're a large government agency like DOD, uh, the first thing you need to start looking at is how do I manage identity within the organization? Because identity management is really the cornerstone of how I secure transactions. And I would say it's not an exaggeration, not knowing anything specific about any of these large companies, that migrating that technology to something that's quantum safe is a five to seven year project. But in some cases, it's even longer. We've talked to banks here in the US where they say, well, that's a seven to 10 year project. So now we're 2028. We're really on the cusp. We're really on the cusp of NSA's pessimistic guidance and well past IBM's, IBM's optimistic guidance. So, it's really critical to start doing those evaluations today and looking at what do I need to start implementing to protect my overall infrastructure and then deal with it on a priority basis. So as I said, I'm not so concerned if I'm a bank about today's credit card transactions because you're gonna get two or three credit cards before there's a quantum threat. But I am concerned about protecting all of the information that's in the bank, especially those higher value transactions, and we really need to start looking at that now. And, it, and this will be 
a nation state attack initially, right? It's not going to be the traditional stereotypical hacker sitting in their basement someplace. It'll be a nation state doing a very targeted attack at high value information that destabilizes a government or an economy. And is it fair to say that when that attack does come, you won't know? You won't know. And that's the problem, right? You, if you get a rogue software update for your car or your phone, um, the problem is we rely on cryptography to ensure that I get an authenticated update for my phone that hasn't been tampered with that I know I can apply. So once I have a quantum computer, you can get an authenticated update that hasn't been tampered with that you think has come from your vendor, but it hasn't. And there's no way technology-wise that you're going to be able to distinguish between the two. And that's going to be one of the problems, by the way, with blockchain as well. And is is that is that a quantum computer will be able to forge a certificate, uh, certificate authority, and appear just like another member of the blockchain operating within the ledger, and there won't be any kind of trace. I mean, that's one of the things about classical hackers, isn't it? I mean, they break in, and then your uh, well, it's, it's your, even, your ISO guys plunge in, and they say, "Oh my God, we've had a breach." And, I, I would say it's a, it's even a little more frightening than that. So. When you look at, you know, we've got a public ledger of transactions. One of the things that I do is I, I use my public key as a way to authenticate myself and verify a transaction. Um, or people use my public key to verify that I did a transaction that was signed with my private key. The problem in using Shor's algorithm is I can reverse this function. So once, once I know your public key, I can get your private key, which means I'm you. So as soon as you commit a transaction to a public ledger, a hacker who gets that can now be you. So they can go and maybe empty your wallet of cryptocurrency right. or forge future transactions on your behalf. And it all appears within the network as if you're just valid and transactions. And you can't tell the difference between. Can't tell the difference between. There's other, other elements built into different blockchain systems to help mitigate that, but fundamentally uh, that's the challenge with public key cryptography built into those. One last question, then we'll open it up to the audience, and that is about uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Yeah. They're working in the area right now to arrive at a standard for quantum resistant algorithms. Uh, their timeline kind of stretches out there. Yeah. Uh, out to about like 20, 30. From the, from the point of view of, first of all, arriving at the standard and then for the rollout, they're looking at a date coming about 20, 34, 35 for the process to be complete, which is a long time. Uh, I'll be nearly 50 by then, so that is going to be a real, <laughs> yeah. a real issue. The other qu but my question for you is, do we wait for NIST? Do we ask NIST to maybe move a bit faster? Or is it the case, and we were just talking about global standards, is, are there ways in which you can, in fact, arrive at standards which are compatible with NIST future standard, right. but which could be implemented in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bilateral way yeah. or with companies now. Yeah, so, so NIST is one of you know, probably a dozen different standard bodies that we engage in to look at how cryptographic functionality has to evolve in order to provide quantum safe security in the future. So the NIST specific question, I, I mean, I'm certainly not here to, to give them guidance or direction, but I would certainly encourage that process to be accelerated to the extent it can be because I don't think that we can wait. We're in a in a breakthrough-driven uh, uh, ecosystem here with respect to quantum computing. And you heard Ray this morning talk about, you know, things that two or three years ago seemed impossible are, are now possible and routine. And, you know, now we have grad students building small, you know, quantum computers in a summer internship program, which, again, a decade ago would have been impossible to even conceive yeah. of. So any breakthrough that accelerates the development of a quantum computer to a point where it becomes a cryptographic threat becomes a real challenge given that timeline from this. So I would encourage them to, to accelerate where they can. Obviously, we want to be careful because we don't want to make the wrong choice and, and choose standards from a, a cryptographic standpoint that would not give us the protection they, we intend them to do. But there's other bodies. So, so an example here is we're working with the ITUT, which is the United Nations Standards Body. They control the X509 standard. X509 is that digital certificate that provides identity. So that's what's on the smart card that the DOD user has. Um, that's what Amazon has when you sign onto the website and you click the little green lock. Underneath there is an X509 certificate. Um, so we've been working with, X, with, with the ITUT to change the X509 standard to allow for a multi-mode of operation where you can have quantum safe credentials and classical credentials that coexist in the same certificate. And that standard should be published in January. 
And then you've got bodies like the IETF, or the Internet Engineering Task Force, where we're working with them in collaboration with companies like, like Cisco to look at the Ike standard, which is the Internet Key Exchange for VPNs, or the TLS standard, which is that core communication standard that we use on the Internet when we do that HTTPS request and want to do online commerce. Those are big, important standards that need to be modified to ensure that they can handle whatever the outcome of NIST has, but also give us the agility where today I can make a selection and say, I'm going to use lattice-based cryptography, and if something happens in the next five years and I have to move from lattices to isogenies, um, it's not like I have to change all my infrastructure. I just have to issue a new certificate to my users, and we do that transition. What's remarkable is we built this technology and this entire security ecosystem over the last 40 years with really very little consideration for this cryptographic agility and planning of any sort of migration. You know, in the past, we've just made keys longer and more complex, but we haven't had to change the way we do this or we haven't had to do a migration. The closest thing we could draw as a parallel there is um, NSA published something called Suite B in 2005, and this was the future for cryptographic interoperability, a set of algorithms and parameters that we were going to standardize on. In that was elliptic curve cryptography, which is largely like the next generation of crypto to provide some protection if quantum computers or some other threat uh, became a, a concern for RSA. In 2015, after 10 years, they published a guide that said, if you haven't completed your Suite B migration, you can stop. So that's 10 years of you know, thou shalt guidance that says you must do sweet B for interoperability, not done in 10 years, and then abandoned because we have this quantum threat and we don't have a replacement. So in, in Canada, we did a similar cryptographic migration. It took 17 years to complete. So these are not easy things to do, which is why we need to speed up the standards work that's going on, not just at NIST, but at ETSI and ITT and IETF. And if you're talking about the automotive world, SAE or X9 and financial services, all of these bodies create standards that allow for interoperability between enterprises or entities and technology vendors, and we have to make sure they all move much quicker than they are now. Yeah, and that issue about interoperability or compatibility becomes the key, so you don't wind up with a choice between either waiting for NIST to finish or a Robertson screw. Yeah, we, we really, yeah. <laughs> we need a bridge secured with Robertson screws that will allow us to go whichever direction NIST kind of comes at the end of their process, but let's build into our core infrastructure the agility that is lacking so that we can have that, that easy migration in the, future. Right, in the future. Should we have some questions from that? Absolutely, yeah. There, and then we come here. Hi, thanks, Scott. I'm Adelia Friedson. I helped co-found this initiative with Arthur, and now I work at a technology company here in Arlington. Um, and my question, I think, is is asking similar to what you, you just wrapped up. So if I'm the CEO at that car company that you were telling you about, and I'm thinking to myself, I need to think about how I'm going to secure my cars in, the, in 2020 all the way up to 2030, um, I think to myself, well, what are the first steps that I need to do in order to do that? I don't necessarily want to wait for a NIST standard because by then it might be too late. So what what would a CEO in that position do? And I, I think what I hear you saying is that uh, there are potentials for them, a CEO in that position, or even a CISO or someone who's not that high up, to take their business and start implementing some of the pathways to get there, even if maybe that certified standard comes a little bit later, but beginning to implement those pathways early is something that is possible right now. Am I understanding yeah. that correctly? Oh, you're right. There's, there's sort of these, these architectural changes and decisions we can make now to prepare us for cryptographic agility. But there's other elements of this, this suite of future quantum safe algorithms that we have a high degree of confidence in. One of them is something called stateful hash-based signatures. Studied for a long time. We know what they're going to be. We know that NIST is basically going to say this is an acceptable standard when they complete this competition. So there's a high degree of confidence that you could use that today. In fact, we're working with a couple automotive OEMs where that technology is what in technology terms is the hardware root of trust. That's going to be the basis that we use to build the rest of the platform on. So if you're a technology company or you're an enterprise, you can start with what's the lowest level kind of hardware root of trust. And are there technology selections we can make today that are going to give us the longevity we need to build the rest of the platform around it? If you can't do a software update in the future, then 
you know, the cost to change or mitigate this risk is going to go up substantially because you'll have to recall a car or some other piece of hardware, replace that piece of hardware, and then ship it back out, which is way more costly than just doing a software update that, that somebody does in their home network someplace. Because the, the goal, isn't it, is that in terms of this migration, that you want it to be something which is a matter of life cycle management for your exactly. Italian day and not a crisis management. Well, we have that luxury. If we start now, it can be standard life cycle ma management. If we wait five or six years, it becomes crisis different. Management. And crisis management is expensive and error prone. Right? I'm sorry, do you have another question? You actually have a, a separate question. I was wondering if you could talk about AES encryption because that's something that I know has come up um, in certain conversations, maybe in DOD, for example, and there's been debate about whether or not that is a viable replacement to uh, public key encryption or whether or not? They, they, they generally do two di slightly different things. So AES or symmetric cryptography where we have a pre-shared secret. Um, the net effect based on what we see in quantum computers today is essentially uh, a halving of the key size. So AES-256 effectively gives you 128 bits of security in a post-quantum world, which, which still would be deemed sufficient for classified communications here in the United States. Um, it's a little less practical to distribute that key because what we use public key crypto for is so that you and I can share a secret on a public network. And then we use AES to do the, the, the bulk encryption afterwards. So um, it's not kind of a wholesale replacement. Other, you know, one, one of the solutions, if you go to like say the, the, the fighter jet, is you get a bunch of guys in uniforms with USB keys and they go around and they update the keying material on the jet every time you need to rotate keys. And that, that actually is what happens today in many cases. But that's not a practical solution when you have you know, tens of millions of users who you need to update on a regular basis. So um, I think the symmetric key, there's discussions going on about do we make AES longer or have an alternative cipher that's you know 512 bits or some, some longer key length. But for the most part, when we're talking about symmetric crypto, uh, if you're doing a, using AES-256, I, I would say you're generally good at this point notwithstanding some other breakthroughs that would look for more efficient uh, attacks on it. That one is uh, Grover's algorithm rather than Shor's algorithm that we talked about this morning. Additional questions here? Wait, catch your mic there. Uh, Bridget Walsh, uh, Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, so you mentioned that um, with uh, the cryptographic algorithms that are under development for post-quantum security. There's a lot of research sitting behind the math problems in many years there that give us a lot of trust. Um, but when I look back and think about, you know, implementations over time of things like RSA and, you know, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, the implementations themselves sometimes had some errors, some flaws, and, you know, the community got better over time at dealing with those things. What are your thoughts on how the cryptographic community can um, sort of in what research is required to ensure that as we implement new cryptographic algorithms in a compressed time frame, um, that we're ready for those secure um, implementations sort of that help back up the math. Yeah. Um, oh boy, this is going to sound, this is going to make me sound like an old man yelling at the kids to get off my lawn. Uh, but uh, I, boy, I, the, the implementation of the cut and paste functionality in the developer world seemed to cause propagation of, uh, of buggy buggy code, um, not in the case of the cryptographic sense, but um, there's a level of, of, I think, training in, in how to develop code well in a very constrained environment that is essential. So our development team is well experienced writing, you know, highly, um, um, highly specialized C code, so we're very portable across multiple different platforms. Um, we, we have development standards, so we create banned function lists and we create uh, uh, appropriate use of functions and we do a lot of sort of check-in and, uh, and peer review of anything that we check in. That's a mature development process. And I think um, when you start talking about sensitive security functionality, and this would apply even to my time at BlackBerry, is um, there's a lot of manual and automated approaches to do code reviews to help you identify some of those low-hanging issues. Um, but fundamentally, it's a, it's a quality issue in ensuring that the developers that are implementing the code, whether you do it in-house or you're looking for some you know, third-party party library, uh, you'd want to make sure that the developers actually understand how to write secure code and are willing to go through some sort of audit from a compliance standpoint. Um, 
I, I know CSE, NSA, the the GCHQ guys, they all have different approaches on on how they do that. And a lot of times, it's uh, it's a combination of classified and unclassified tools, manual and automatic code review. Um, but ultimately, that's really beyond the math. It's a function of ensuring that the developers actually know how to write constrained code and that they don't do that in a way, they don't write code that has functions that are unnecessary or code paths that are just not always executed properly. Is that a common problem? In large complex systems, we always see bugs. There's a, there's a percentage of bug per, percentage of defect per 100,000 lines. I don't know what the number is off the top of my head, but it's an alarmingly large number. And when you think about a car with 18 or 20 million lines of code, or a jet with 100, with 100 million lines of code, um, there's a number of software bugs that are just inherent in the platform. It's just a, a factor of today's development environment. Um, other questions? Then I had another one for you, too. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, that is, from where you are, your, the work that you're doing, what your company does, how do you rate your uh, U.S. competition in terms of the private sector and companies working in this area? Uh, surprisingly, we don't see a lot, right? So we're we're three and a half. I was afraid I was afraid because that was going to be your answer. <laughs> oh well, we, we like to be here, so uh, <laughs> we we like to be the solution provider. It's it's um, it's one of these areas where when you look at it from a and again, I think it speaks to the ecosystem that we're in and and the good fortune that we have to have, you know, Quantum Valley there, both as, as the ecosystem and then Quantum Valley Investments as the investor that's enabled us to get to where we are today. Um, what we see from a competition standpoint is, is um, a little bit of research going on in some of the big tech companies here in the US, but not a significantly large amount. So, so Microsoft is fairly active in one or two areas of research. Cisco's in, active in another, Amazon's in another, but um, I don't think any of them have the same scale of resources currently working on the problem that we do, or as, as sort of complete in their coverage of the different areas of math, nor do I see them looking at the, the bigger migration pieces. So a lot of the research we see today is, is academically focused on getting the math right, and that's critically important. Um, a lot less research on how do we deal with this at a system level so we can do this migration, which is probably even more important. That's, a, that's an equally hard and probably more important problem to solve right now is providing that migration path. Um, and then the, the other piece that we see a little bit here in the US is, is things like quantum key distribution where there's early work to commercialize QKD type solutions, but we solve a slightly different problem. QKD doesn't do authentication, right? So if you have quantum key distribution, you still need to authenticate who the right. user is at the other end, and, and uh, that's it's not an encry it's not a substitute for an encryption system. It's simply a means. Of uh, they're complementary in how yeah. in how you would use the technology. So, uh, you know, we just uh, I, I would say we're, we're in a position now where we see a lot of you know younger startups than us. So you know, four or five uh, people trying to make a go of it, and it's going to take a while to get to a level of maturity. We're forty-ish people right now. And uh, we've, been, so we've been doing it for about three and a half years. So we, we, we don't see a ton, not just in the US, but even in, in Canada, the, the biggest competitors we might see would be seven or eight people. And, and mostly academic focus. So they're still trying to bootstrap out of academia into a commercial success. Well, it's good news for you, but kind of <laughs> alarming news uh, from the point of view of uh, both in terms of the competition in the marketplace, but also for. Uh, people getting their minds around this problem and what needs to be done. Because in other words, we could, we could, it's, you could envision a scenario, can't you, in which NIST arrives at the uh, uh, QRA standards, but there's no one to give them to. Well, there, there's, there's a lot of academic work to do build open source libraries that's going on. Okay. Um, and that, that's suitable for, for certain uses, we, but we see critical infrastructure providers who are making conscious decisions to not use open source, right? Because they don't want to, no. you know, there's a, there, there's, you know, a bit of a fallacy that more eyes make it more secure at times, but we've also seen what a kind of homogenous use of open source does when we have something like open SSL fail with the Heartbleed incident uh, a couple of years ago, where 65% of internet traffic is protected with open SSL, and if something goes wrong there in a catastrophic sense, it goes really wrong. So. Our version of the IRS is the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, and they had to stop taking taxes. So you know that's a bad security issue when the when tax department stop, yeah. won't take taxes anymore. 
Um, so we, we've seen what happens when we get a reliance on open source solutions and something goes catastrophically wrong. So we are seeing a bit of a shift in critical infrastructure providers where you know, the open source work might be a great reference implementation, but they would like to see something more closed source and proprietary that's going to be critical to providing security for them. We have a question here. And then this can actually go to anyone who's spoken today, and maybe a good question to kind of sum it up, but where do we go from here? In other words, we, there were so many great topics that were talked about today. Uh, a couple of salient points that I, that I got out of this was the need for a constantly improving error correction, uh, the need for standards, the need to having people in industry to receive these standards. Are the kids all right? Like, is everybody doing everything the way they should do, and we just have to keep doing it, and we just need more people to do it? Or do you or any of the people who have spoken today see any type of process in our building quantum ecosystem that needs improvement? Like we mentioned earlier, on a federal level, do we need to you know, uh, combine efforts? Uh, on an intellectual properties level, do we need to all the more so give inventors their rights? Uh, do we need to re and recruit more people to do error correction and focus more money on that? Do you see everything is happening the way it should, or is there something you would recommend and say, you know what, if I were president of North America, I would do things like this to, so that we can get the quantum, com the universal quantum computer before China. What would you, what would you say needs to be improved? And this question can go to anyone who's spoken or anybody. Yeah. So, um, I, I think what I see now, and, and I have a narrow view on it, and, and I'm sure more people have different perspective, is on the quantum computing front, we're still in kind of a very early stage of development, which, and the same would apply for the quantum safe crypto. The Etsy working group is very friendly and open and collaborative. Um, and I think that's about to change, and that's probably the wrong thing. So we have a commercial race. We've got Rigetti and Google and IBM and Microsoft all racing to claim quantum supremacy or quantum advantage, whatever they're rebranding it to. Um, but there's still a lot of, I think, good collaboration. I think as we get closer, uh, the, the risk and the concern that I would see from a, a Western North American uh, standpoint is that collaboration will diminish because people will see commercial opportunity and they'll want to seize that. And that would give our adversaries a, a, an opportunity to continue to advance faster than, than we are. So uh, finding a way to balance the IP protection and the opportunity to monetize uh, advances in, in the scientific area against sort of national security issues of not being kind of leaders in this area is probably the biggest thing to try and, that I would say to try and resolve. On the math side of things, um, there's really good collaboration between academia and companies like mine and standards bodies today. Um, I, I would still think we could do a better job to accelerate that work, but I'm encouraged by sort of the, um, the work we did with the ITUT, uh, where we had you know, Canadian representation, European representation, uh, companies like, like Cisco uh, from the U.S. backing the submissions we were making to change the standard. That, to me, is encouraging that we're doing the right things. Um, I think all of this could happen a little bit faster. But that's only my perspective on it. I think my biggest fear is that as we get closer to commercial reality and people seeing this multi-billion or trillion dollar opportunity, that we close ranks and we stop talking to each other about how we can ad advance. And that would apply both from a commercial standpoint as well as what I would say broadly a more five-eye standpoint if we're looking at it from a national security perspective. Yeah, I'm glad you put in the plug on the five eyes because I think that, again, as, we were, as I was pointing out before, that is the key, I think, for the international. Number one, speaking for myself, that U.S. needs to look to allies, both for examples like Quantum Valley, but also for expertise in some of these areas, like, for example, uh, uh, post-quantum cryptography. But also that the idea that well, how you share and what you share needs to be thought out very, very carefully. And the best place in which to do that is a table with your closest allies, not leaving it to chance, and also not leaving it just to uh, a, a, a sense of proprietary instinct, which is we just have a big breakthrough, let's hold on to it and not share it with anybody because we'll make a lot of money at the end. And I think that's the kind of challenge that we face, for example, in the semiconductor industry, which finally had to be overcome. And I don't think we're at that point yet in terms of the innovation curve with regard to quantum technology. But I think you don't, you don't want to shut, you don't want to shut the windows 
and shut the doors too soon. But you also have to be careful about who gets in and out of the House. Boy, are you going to enjoy reading that my report on Five Eyes on Quantum when it's when it comes out in the next couple of weeks. Well, and I will say that you know, ICERA I actually has sent letters of support in for those bills, uh, recognizing that it may help fund competitors here in the U.S., but also acknowledging the importance of making sure that we see the government support to expand research and open up collaboration opportunities. I think it's it's critically important. So as a as a foreign company, we, we've sent letters of support in both to the Senate and Congress for the bills that have been put together. So why don't we end it there? We can continue the conversation at the reception outside. Thank you so much for joining us and staying uh, with the discussion. Uh, thanks again to Scott Totsky and to all of our panelists for a really, really great, really great conference. Thanks again. Thank you.